Good morning, everyone. I think we're going to get started. I am excited to introduce to you our first plenary speaker today, Ariel Chakwe Deranger. Ariel is an Indigenous rights activist and member of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation of Treaty 8 in Northern Alberta. Ariel is currently the Executive Director and Co-Founder of Indigenous Climate Action, Canada's premier Indigenous-led climate justice organization. Ariel's work has bridged the environmental and Indigenous rights movement, building out an Indigenous rights-based approach to challenging fossil fuel development. Her experience working within the environmental justice and Indigenous rights field is demonstrated through her work with organizations such as the UN, Indigenous Environmental Network, Rainforest Action Network, Federal of Saskatchewan Indian Nations, and with her home nation, the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation. Please welcome Ariel Chakwe Deranger. Good morning. Iklanate. Dene Sotlane Ariel Tseekwe Huche, Durange Betsi Ani Hesli. My name is Ariel Tseekwe, and I'm lucky to say that I don't have a colonial name, and I, my parents were very proud Indigenous people that gave me an Indigenous name, and my name means Thunder Woman. And my mom always makes jokes that she named me really well because I'm loud like thunder. I want to start today by recognizing the traditional territory, the Algonquin people, where we reside today. The Algonquin People's Territory encompasses the Ottawa Valley and adjacent territory that butts along the Ontario and Quebec borders. And the Algonquin people, unlike many other people in this region, never signed a land treaty. And so we have to recognize this territory as Algonquin territory. So I want to thank the Algonquin people. Masi Cho Hai Hai. I like to start my presentations with this map. Does anyone know what this is a map of? What is it, what's identifying? It's identifying indigenous peoples. We don't often look at the world through this lens, looking at indigenous peoples, because we're often a marginalized and underrepresented group. But in fact, we represent 5% of the global population, or roughly 370 million people worldwide, with over 5,000 distinct languages, cultures, governance, and ways of knowing and living and being in over 90 different countries. What gets really interesting is when we start to dig deeper into Indigenous peoples, we recognize that they occupy or use 22 to 64, depending on who you ask and what agency, of the land surface is recognized or occupied by Indigenous peoples. That's really interesting in comparison to cities, which actually only occupy about 3 to 4 percent of the land mass on planet Earth. It starts to get even more interesting when we start to look at what that land represents. And that land represents 80% of the world's biodiversity, which is critical for climate stabilization and human health. And even further, furthermore, 85% of the world's protected and conservation areas are within or adjacent to indigenous territories. I'm a member of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, which sits right next to the UNESCO World, Nation, or World Wood Buffalo National Park. And so I know this very well. We are part of a park that sits really close. Um, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, valued for its rich biodiversity. And it's a part of our identity as Indigenous people. These facts and stats aren't an accident. Indigenous cultures are an identity are intrinsically linked to healthy ecosystems in lands. My people, the Kaitale Dene Sotlane people, are Kaitale, and Kaitale means of the willow. Of the willow is a representation of the delta and where we reside, and it's a part of our critical identity. We are also caribou people, which is a representation of the food sources that we eat. And if you talk to any indigenous people across the world, they closely are connected to the lands and their identities, their cultures, their ceremonies, and their languages are connected to those ecosystems. 
Indigenous people's rights have been recognized the world over underneath the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And this is a really important piece of legislation that frames Indigenous peoples and our rights. And this is important because this document sets the bare minimum standards for the recognition of Indigenous peoples. And it's, um, the foundation of this document is self-determination and systems of free, prior, and informed consent. So getting a yes or no from Indigenous communities on how their lands and territories are utilized is a critical component to respecting and upholding the rights of Indigenous peoples. This UN Convention is also unique in its, um, in its state because it's one of the only UN Conventions that was created in partnership with Indigenous peoples and took over 20 years to get to that point. Canada is a signatory. They signed on in 2010, three years after it was originally proposed. Um, and the Trudeau government is looking at ways to implement this legislation at this time. However, the history of Canada isn't one that's full of happy, wonderful, um, you know, recognition of Indigenous rights. In fact, this country was built on the premise of domination over not just the land, but also the people. While we recognize that our Indigenous territories have been treated, I'd like to show this map because I like to depict the fact that while we have many treaties in this country, there are many territories and areas of this country that are still untreated. The yellow territories in the map of Canada are what we call unceded or untreated territories. And that's really important to think about because when we talk about land use and land management, those people are in fact the traditional owners and no treaties were signed. In 1763, there is a, 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 a treaty that was called the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which set a precedence that no land would be taken up without a treaty or an agreement for the sharing of the land. So this is a treaty medal, and I like to depict it because it shows two people coming together and sharing, shaking hands, because these treaties were set on a premise of sharing the land and caring for the land together. My ancestors signed treaty in 1899, and they did so to protect and preserve the land and territories that were a part of our identities. However, these treaty rights have been diminished severely. If you look at the previous slide, where the treaty map, you see how vast the territories are, and you look to nowadays where our lands and territories have been minimized to reservations. These little dots on the map are the only lands and territories that First Nations actually have management over those lands and territories, which is only 0.2% of the land mass in Canada, and the other 99.8% is under the jurisdiction of the government. And this becomes a really critical point when we start to talk about land development. I'm going to use the Alberta oil sands or tar sands as a case study for what that looks like when First Nations don't have control over their lands and territories. So this is where my community comes from, Fort Chippewan, which is downstream from the largest industrial project on planet Earth, the Alberta oil sands. The oil sands are extracted in two different methods. 20% is open pit mining and 80% is in situ or SAG-D, which is steam assisted gravity drainage. And I'm going to show you a short video that depicts what the tar sands extraction process is like. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna do this first. Uh, the oil sands has a rich history in the province of Alberta in its development, where we've seen it continue to almost double every decade in the region from just under half a million in 1995 to 2.8 million in 2017, it's projected over 3.2 million in 2020, and over 4.7 projected for in 2030. And so we see this and we call this out of control or um, unprecedented development in the region. Alberta sits over one of the largest recoverable oil patches in the world, second only to Saudi Arabia, covering 149,000 square kilometers, an area larger than England. It holds at least 175 billion barrels of crude bitumen found beneath boreal forest, muskeg, and rivers. To access the sandy tar-like substance, the land referred to by the industry as overburden is removed and saved for future reclamations. 
Cranes and 400-ton trucks haul the bitumen off to extraction plants, where, in order to separate the sand from the bitumen, it is mixed with large amounts of fresh water, heated by natural gas. It is then spun with a chemical solvent to further remove clay and minerals, leaving the remaining wastewater to be dumped into enormous, toxic tailings ponds. The siphoned-off bitumen is then sent into pipelines to be processed into crude oil throughout North America. That video is from a movie called H2 Oil, and it depicts the open pit um, or open cast mining process that is utilized to extract 20% of the oil sands and tar, or tar sands. That extraction method is heavily used in my people's traditional territory in the Treaty 8 region north of Fort McMurray. 80% of the tar sands, though, is extracted through a method called in situ, or steam-assisted gravity drainage, which involves um, injecting and superheating water into the ground to melt the bitumen, and then it's sucked up through another series of pipeline uh, mixed with diluents and solvents so that they can actually ship it through pipelines to other refineries to be processed even more. The government refers to that in situ or SAG-D as a more environmentally friendly method, but what we look at is that it actually ends up fracturing the landscape because of the vastness and the, the size and enormity of the different types of projects that are being proposed in the region. This is a map that shows what it looks like for the fracturing of the lands and territories. The process for tar sands is highly water intensive with three to four barrels of water for one barrel of oil and that water ends up being a toxic contamination afterwards that now is put into what we call tailings ponds but are more like lakes and covers an area of 260 square kilometers in my people's traditional territory in the Kaitale Dene Sotlane territory. These contaminants, which consist of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, arsenic, mercury, um, ketamine, selenium, um, not ketamine, sorry, <laughs> selenium, and uh, other toxic contaminants are entering into our system through leaching through these tailing systems that aren't lined. These are simply put into these tailings where they are hoping that they'll dry and evaporate over time, and then they put sand over top of it. But these toxic contaminants are leaching into our water systems, and the Pembina Institute released a study in 2008 that listed about 11 million liters of toxic contaminant are leaching into our river systems every single day. This picture I like to show um, is because on the one hand side right over here, you can see there's a big large river system and that river system is the Athabasca River system. That river leads to the community of Fort Chippewan downstream, my community. And you can see the tailings ponds at the bottom, up near on the, on the top side you see black and that's pet coke that lines the rivers of the, of the Athabasca and in the background we have sulfur pyramids that are five stories high and three blocks long. All of this is contributing to contaminants in the air, on the land, and in the water. And moreover to the direct contaminants in the region, we now are contributing large amounts of greenhouse gas emissions into the global stratosphere, contributing to being one of Canada's fastest growing source of greenhouse emissions in the country and accounting for more emissions than all the cars on the road in Canada combined. But what does that mean for our people? It means that our lands and ecosystems that are intrinsically tied to our identity are being destroyed. The rich biodiversity that we have protected and strive to protect since colonization is being completely changed. The biodiversity is not coming back the way that they promised. Industry continues to make claims of reclamation and they bring this forward to our communities and they say, look, we're reclaiming the land. But in actuality, the reclamation standards are poor, and this is not the equivalent land use capacity that we are expecting. And in fact, to date, less than 0.1% of all tar sands operations have been certified as reclaimed. That means for 40 to 100 years, the land in our territory is being robbed of our people. This is multiple generations of people whose identities are being robbed from them, from being separated from the lands and environment, and the legacy of contamination is left for our people to contend with. 
Indigenous people's health is affected by cultural loss, racism and stigmatization, loss of language and connection to land, environmental deprivation, and feeling spiritually, emotionally, and mentally disconnected from our Indigenous identities. Being disconnected from our Indigenous identity can damage Indigenous people's health. So when we're looking at the Alberta tar sands, we're not just talking about direct implications from the damaging uh, impacts of contamination, but we're actually talking about mental and spiritual losses from a loss of connection to our lands and identities. These industries are contaminating our food sources from direct contamination of species like these ducks landing in these tailings ponds to the contaminations of our water systems through the deformities of fish, which are major sources of food in our region, to the actual disrespect of our lands and species. The large picture is a beheaded bison. And I use this picture to bring forward something that we don't often talk about. As we lose connection to lands and places, we also start to disrespect those places. This bison was found by hunters in my people's traditional territory, and it was beheaded. This bison was hunted simply for a trophy, and this bison could have fed three families for a whole season had it been hunted and utilized in its traditional manner. This is a spiritual, spiritually significant species and a significant species for food in our region. And what we have seen is this disconnection from the importance of these ecosystems, both for, uh, for our environments and health, but also for the spiritual well-being and the respect of indigenous communities in these territories. What this has also led to is this imposition of the colonial state on our people. As we lose uh, the ability to access our lands and territories, we also lose our ability for food security, and we are subject to having to buy uh, Western foods and groceries. I'm lactose intolerant, and I like to show this because we're often forced into adopting Western diets. And this is one of the grocery stores in Fort Chippewan where a gallon of milk or four liters of milk is 16 to 17, sometimes $18 a year. It might not be as high as in Nunavut and other places in the high Arctic, but we are dealing with exorbitant high costs of food that is another pressure on our people that pushes us further into poverty. All of this is leading to a whole plethora of health implications. So in 2014, there was a study done by the University of Manitoba that linked oil sand pollution to higher cancer rates in our community. But that also comes from the fact that we are put, being pushed away from our traditional food sources, that we are being pushed away from our culture and identity as Indigenous peoples. You would think that we would be moving away from these industries in a, the time where we have the Trudeau government making promises to address the climate for truth and reconciliation in our country, but in fact, we are moving the opposite direction. Trudeau said no country would find 173 barrel, billion barrels of oil in the ground and just leave them there. And while we are seeing protests mount on the West Coast against the Trans Mountain Pipeline, he said First Nations will protest, but Trans Mountain Pipeline will be a done deal. And the Supreme Court has made it clear that Indigenous peoples can't veto pipelines. All of this is in contravention to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. All of this is in contravention to the treaties and the promises that were made to this country. All of, all of this is just adding insult to injury. As we find out that exasperating climate change is coming to the forefront, we're also looking for solutions. And former president of the UN, Gen UN uh, General Assembly stated that indigenous peoples interpret and react to the impacts of climate change in creative ways, drawing on traditional knowledge and other technologies to find solutions that society at large can replicate to counter pending changes. Now, indigenous knowledge is simply knowledge that an indigenous or local community accumulates over generations of living in a particular environment. And so that's not just my knowledge, but I carry the knowledge of my father 
and my grandfather and my great-grandfather and so on and so forth. We pass down this information multi-generationally. So when you look at the timelines of our studies on a particular thing, like maybe caribou, which is a significant species, is we're not studying it just for 10 years or 15 years, but we've been studying it for millennia. So indigenous peoples, so some more facts, we manage 11% of the world's forests. And when you look at the biodiversity of indigenous lands and territories the world over, we encompass and contain over 312 billion tons of carbon. So our lands and territory are sequestering massive amounts of carbon. Locally in Canada, the Canada's boreal forest accounts for 22% of the global carbon sequestration, or about 22% of the world's carbon emissions annually are sequestered by Canada's boreal forests. And most of that isn't from the trees like we talk about in the Amazon rainforest, but it's actually in the rich soil and biodiversity in our territories. And if you look at this map, the Aboriginal peoples of North America's boreal forest is rich, and it coincides with those that are fighting to protect the lands and territory. But massive um, anthropogenic activities in our lands and territories have created major shifts and changes to how those lands are managed and how those lands are taken care of. So when we think about what is the role of indigenous peoples in our lands and territories, what does it mean to respect and implement the rights of indigenous peoples? Our identities are intrinsically linked to healthy ecosystems. And when we have children and elders and multi-generations utilizing the lands together, we have healthier, happier communities. The word Dene, my people, are Dene people. If you break it down into two simple words, the De and Ne, the De means to flow, and the Ne means to flow from the earth. So Dene means to flow from the earth, and as we flow from the earth, we work in harmony with her. And indigenous rights are being recognized moreover for their relationships with the land and the knowledge that our communities hold and bring forward. It has been recognized within the UN Paris Agreement for its role, and more recently, the UN um, subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice recognized indigenous knowledge and knowledge systems as a critical component for implementing the UN Paris Agreement. The earth is out of balance, and we are out of balance with ourselves and with Mother Earth. In order to address the climate crisis, we must restore our relationship with Mother Earth and with each other and address the imbalance in all aspects of our lives. When our communities are standing up against these oppressive projects that are not just destroying our lands and territory, but are implicit and complicit with the destruction and abrogation of treating Aboriginal rights, we stand up. And we must recognize that as Indigenous people stand up and fight and challenge these projects, so that is it a part of protecting and conserving the biodiversity of this country that is critical for climate mitigation, that is critical for healthy, happy communities. And when communities are given the power back, they do beautiful things. The environmental governance on Haida Gwaii is a great example. I encourage you to take a look at it. But moreover, when communities are given the ability to stand up and protect the land, we see real action being taken place. And we see communities doing wonderful and beautiful things and bringing them from poverty and despair into uh, a world where they see possibilities, where they can see themselves as the change makers that our world needs. Thank you, Masi Cho. I think we're going to have time for one quick question. So if anyone has a question, please provide your name and affiliation. Ms. Deringer, thank you very much. Very good presentation. My name is David Zwolak, and interestingly enough, from the U.S. Department of Energy. But a question I have, um, uh, very informative, and really, really two questions. 
And first off, um, my understanding, and, and either correct me or, or clarify, mm -hmm. is it tar sands, are they, is it net uh, energy positive or is it net energy negative is question number one. And question number two um, is with the tar sands being the, the highest, the, the fastest growing source of greenhouse gases in Canada, is that just from the operation of the tar sands, or is that the aggregate yeah. of the oil produced and then currently and then burned? Yeah. And again, uh, questions are asked respectfully. Thank yeah. you. So um, as far as energy positive versus energy negative, um, the I guess it depends on who you ask. Um, it depends on who you ask. The the Alberta government and the industry says that they that it's not obviously it's not a po energy negative energy project. Otherwise, they wouldn't be pursuing it. But when you start to look at the impacts on the local impacts and the the resources that it takes for the extraction of this process, everything from natural gas that is utilized to extract uh, the tar sands from the soil, so the processing for it to extract it is quite heavy. They actually utilize about three, um, enough natural gas annually to heat three million homes, so this si a city the size of Calgary, to produce just under two million barrels now, so or two million, just over two million barrels per day right now, million barrels per day. Um, but they also use massive amounts of water, they use massive amounts of energy in the extraction process itself through the mining. The in situ is definitely more energy positive than the open pit and open cast mining, but it's just starting to ramp up now. So for the last 20 years, most of the extraction has been done in a very sort of, I would say, energy neutral almost. And in, if you ask me, it's actually energy negative process, which is the open cast mining. But as we move more towards the extraction process and in situ or SAG-D, it is less intensive, but the impacts as far as contamination and degradation to the environment can be just as devastating because of the broad uh, scale of the, of the extraction process of in situ and SAG-D. Um, the second question was, Sorry. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, growing greenhouse gas, yeah. uh, was it just from the operation no. itself or does it include ultimately yeah. burning the, the oil? So the extraction, the extraction process and the ge greenhouse gas emissions, it's, it's from wheels to well. So we're looking at the everything from the trucks and the extraction process to the movement of, of tar sands through, right now it's largely through trucks and trains um, and they're moving towards pipelines which is entering into the contentious battle of the Kinder Morgan conversation in British Columbia. So it's quite in energy intensive from the extraction process all the way to the refinement process. And then once you, once you burn the, the oil, there's the further greenhouse yeah. gas release. Yeah, so there's that as well. Great, thank you again.